What's going on, man? Um, dude, Rivian prices. Jesus. Yeah. I you know what, don't understand what's going on with those. Do you know what the retail price is on one of these? I don't know. I'm, I'm, my guess is going to be somewhere in like the 90K range. 75575 Now, I don't think the there was dealer, dealer markup either. Like, I think that was like, that was the price. Um, I, I don't know about base or what, but the, the last two that went on bat, or the only two that went on bat, 119000 both of them, which market set a good price, I guess, but 119000 It's a 50K markup on, on, uh, a truck that is about to be mass produced. Um, there was a quote I looked up. I'm like, how many of these are they going to make? Um, there was something from Electric that said they made about 3,500 already. Um, about 1,200 been delivered to customers. Uh, there's 2,500 in production. Um, it's supposed to be there at the end of Q1, so they're probably delivered already. Uh, but now you have a market that's that's just dumping these, uh, assuming supply is reasonable uh, on the market, and these things are going for forty five thousand more than that's that's insane. Have you seen any around here? Yeah, dude, there's quite a few of them around here. Yeah, yeah. There's there's some went to the, the beach the other day. There was two of them there, and then there's one that drives uh, goes and gets coffee that I get that every Saturday. He's there too. Yeah. But the thing is, is like, so you see how it has that launch edition? They have like the R1S and the R1T. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that different in the launch edition that you're paying a premium for? You know I mean, I didn't no, know I, Yeah, no, you're you're getting the fully loaded, like, you know, release edition. I think they're putting everything that they can in it. Um, but the the window sticker, seventy five thousand. You you know what this is going to be? It's going to be like. You know, we were talking earlier about the Range Rovers and, you know, purchasing it and then getting rid of it as soon as you can to see if you can strike all the irons hot. I, do, I just yep. think it's too much of a, it's too much of a risk because the second they sit there and say, hey, we're, you know, ramping up production, what's going to happen? You're going to be left holding it back. So in finance, I'm glad you said it that way, specifically that way. Um, yeah. In, in finance, there's a term. Bag holder. Now yeah. I want to look. I, I know the term. You know what the term means. But the, I want to look up the Google definition for it. But a bag holder is a slang for investors who hold on to poorly performing investments, where you know your total amount is, is constantly increasing, um, hoping that they will rebound when chances are they will not. I don't think that these will rebound and increase in value after you lose say 50,000 on your Rivian investment in the next year. Uh, but hey, man, power to you. Maybe you're, maybe you're doing it for business or something. Maybe you're just driving that much and it makes sense. Um, I mean, hell, maybe the, the supply chain issues uh, continue being terrible. I think when we, we bought our Model X Tesla in 2020, uh, May, um, out the door, uh, the uh, registration fees, taxes, everything we paid, uh, it's like 136. Um, I went right now. I could probably sell it for more at 20k miles. Plus, um, the, the the brand new performance Model X is the same equivalent, but new ones. Uh, they're going for 150 uh, MSRP, like sticker price. That's not that's not including air, autopilot, which we have. It's not including like so. <laughs> you know, if the world keeps burning and inflation keeps keeps roaring, I don't know. Maybe maybe, but that's uh. I don't think that's a big ask. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Just, I, I think, you know, the whole bag holder thing, like you're talking about, you're just not in a good spot. There's nothing, essentially, there's nothing limited really about it, right? Like you said, to be a mass produced truck, like, I can't justify paying the premium on it. I know you can't. And we have shortages of chipsets and whatnot, but we now have what the plants opening in Illinois, right? I think no, they're getting better. The, yeah, the chip, chips are freeing up. They're getting better. All the auto manufacturers have been coming out saying uh, that there's going to be more available. This is kind of the worst of it. Uh, yeah. End of the year pending, you know, we don't go into nuclear war or something. There'll probably be uh, more chips available. So we'll, we'll see. 
Um, and then the other one, I, I did look at uh, cards and bids here. Uh, yeah, you got 117, 130, uh, 125, 138. Like, oh my goodness. Um, they're, well, what do you think of the trucks? Do, do you think they look pretty good? Do you think? Uh... I think I think they're good looking. I think you know they're a little soft for a truck in the looks department for me, but I think it's a good looking EV truck. And that's kind of how I justify it. It's, it's an EV truck. I could do without the headlights. It just reminds me too much of like a, a modern cafe racer, which is like you got two of them pinned on the front grill. Yeah. You know? But um, I don't think it's bad looking. No, it's got so so do you like do do you like the Cybertruck? Like the, the look I of love, it? Love love the Cybertruck. Okay. So so you're for having a car that looks a little different. Um yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I kind of, I kind of dig it. I mean, the, the cafe racer stuff kind of speaks to our blood and uh, yeah, on on the motorcycle end. So like, I'm I'm digging that. Um, it's it's not a bad looking truck. Like you said, it's a little softer, especially on the backside. It kind of reminds me of the uh, was it the Honda, the Ridgeline, the Ridgeline. Yeah, yeah, kind of yeah. yeah, has that feel to it, right? Like, and it's not overly big. Like, it doesn't it doesn't look like it's going to be in the same class as like the F one fifty or something. It looks like a like a uh maybe a ranger yeah so like what kind of sucks i think in the looks department is one you're the first guys to really get out there with a mass produced truck in the ev market you had a really nice chance of making it an aggressive looking truck so that you're not kind of creating that divide between the guys who are 100 percent into the gas trucks and they sit there and go no that looks too ev for me which is the typical ev trap i think that's nice. If you go back to that right there, I like that, that extra storage space. I want to see someone fly a drone through there, like quickly. That just seems like a really <laughs> good spot, really good spot for a gun rack. Yeah, no, there's a bunch right? of cool uses for that, right? Like, and that's that's the neat thing about the EV stuff. Like it free, it does free up. I think if there was ever a use case for a uh, electric vehicle, it's probably a truck, right? Like. Yeah. As much as the, the truck guys will fight that, um, it, it, you, you free up so much room in the cab, be it in the front and even underneath, because the, the chassis essentially is going to be the same as like my Model X. Like you might have a little bit more suspension, some travel or something, but essentially you have a giant battery and you have um, you have some electric motors. They, they hardly take up any room. You don't have this giant uh, transmission. I mean, think of my Hummer, like you got the... Uh, the Allison 1000 that's tucked up in there. You have the Duramax that's sitting up your, your, next to your, your hip. Um, it takes up all that room. There's just so much so that I can't even touch the, my passenger if I want to. Um, and so, like, this is the beauty of an EV. You can, you can have room like this to do, um, to do whatever, like, like you said, a gun rack or something. The, the downside of having a gun rack here is you actually have to get out of the car. <laughs> like, yeah. like you, the guy, the guy that might be robbing you might might take advantage of that. <laughs> it's a but, the cool thing about these too is like if you notice, like typical pickup trucks are the two two body system, right? So you have the cab and then you have the bed. This is like one unified spot and kind of going with what you're saying for clearance. You don't have you know your front and rear diff in the way if you're trying to off-road. So I think it'll be fun to watch some of these companies make super articulating suspension for these and how that would work or lifts and somebody really takes these off-road. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and eventually when it gets built up, I mean, these, these are gonna perform way better because you don't have, yeah. you, you have that exact specific, uh, uh, you know exactly where the tor torque is, the, where the horsepower is. You don't have to sit there and build up power. Um, it's uh, it's very predictable in a sense. Um, you have to get somebody's got to figure out the battery thing, right? Like, but even then, for a couple hundred miles, especially with more and more of like the chargers kind of opening up, it's not bad. Oh, I kind of like this like almost bench seat look right there. That's pretty cool. Although I, I think that actually probably does come up in the middle quite a bit, but the uh, um, the off road capabilities of these is probably going to be really good. If you think about it, you you're probably more familiar with it than I am, but you know because this is the the four motor, so the motor to each wheel. You know, going off roading and getting stuck, I'm sure they're going to create a system to where you can shut off that one motor that's stuck, put the power to the remaining three, and then pull through. 
So the I am off road, it's going to be really nice. Dude, how cool is that? They have lights in all the doors. So instead of the Rolls umbrella, you get a thousand lumen. That, that, I mean, that's pretty neat. It probably yeah. charges when you put it back in there. I just, I, I just like that because you know, at night you're going around or something, you pop the door open, you got a flashlight there. That's under, that's yeah. underrated uh, convenience. And if you look at those control arms, look at that. They're, they have that nice slight bend into it to create a clear path all the way through. Yeah, I'm not digging what's up underneath though. I wonder. I wonder why they did it like that. Because like, so for instance, like the Hummer, you have. Um, you have portal axles that actually yeah. let you have more clearance up underneath that arm versus having to, to, to run the CV directly up in the middle. Um, here, it looks like you're actually losing clearance by having, having the suspension on there. It's kind of interesting way they did it, but, um, well, it looks like too, this is, I that's not off road. Really sure. I, they create, try to create a little bit more clearance to run through, but, it looks like it's an airbag suspension, which then you're you're talking a whole different game. Yeah, CVs, kind of a normal looking CV. I don't think this is four motor. This is probably two motor, right? Okay. Yeah, you probably got two motor. One one in the back, one in the front. But you were saying in general, like you could you could have four motors and you can have have yeah, yeah. massive control know, there. Yeah, it's true. Because uh, your Tesla is a, a dual motor, right? Yeah, funny story. So the Model X, the performance one, um, they take the long range. They don't have the same motor in the front and the back, neither the performance, neither the long range. Um, so they took the long range. They have a bigger motor in the back and a smaller one in the front. They took the big motor from the long range uh, and put it in the front of the performance. They built a separate um, motor for the performance for the back that's much bigger and put it in there. So there's a it's it's got a ton of power and actually it's, it's really hard to, to break it loose like i've tried the things got like 1100 horsepower or something and a thousand horsepower or whatever and um i i've tried to break it loose around turns and it's, it's it's actually difficult like you've got you have to turn it off in the um um in the controls uh otherwise you're, you're not losing but it's not like a weird loss of power like you get from like uh like my z when i try to kick it kick it out and i have a uh, traction control on um, it does this weird thing where it just you completely feel that power just go, like, go away. On um, the Tesla, it, it, it's much, much more balanced. It's it's uh, it's it's a very well built kind of well thought out mechanism to, to how to manage that. I should say it's almost like trying to kick out a four, an all wheel drive car. You just feel planted all the time. Yeah, it's this is neat. I, I have a uh, I have a friend who who's one of the guys that works on this. Um, I know that they've been busy, um, but it's it's neat. And it's a local car too. It was, it was I think the main hub or like one of the big hubs is Irvine. I like I drive right yeah. by it when I go roll. Um, yeah. You see the you know ribbon on the side. Um, but yeah, no, I, I see these I, I see these regularly now. It's they're 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 interesting looking cars. I know I know um, people have been taking them up to to Santiago Peak, and uh, I'm hoping maybe one of these days when. I'm making my way up there. I can I can see what one looks like off road. Um, but yeah, no, that just the the uh, it, it's interesting to see something get up get bit up like this, where you're you're uh, you're going for twenty uh, fifty thousand more than than the retail price, and uh, there's no dealer markup or anything else. It's like actually the people that are getting in the getting in line and getting the reservations are really benefiting. So um that's really neat um but uh i, I don't suspect that's going to last last too too much longer I, I just i can't imagine it does i just think it's a bunch of people who are too excited about it and are willing to blow the money in, in anticipation that because they have the launch edition it's somehow going to hold more value than any other version and i just don't think it's there it, it, yeah yeah money's money's still too loose apparently to yeah. tell 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 the Fed to keep ratcheting up. We need we need a eight percent interest rates and uh, um, do you do you think do you think with the well I actually get get to that topic topic later. Um, you had posted something about a, a Ferrari. Uh, say again. You had posted something about a Ferrari. Oh, on uh, 
Yeah, so like, we'll jump, jump ahead of that one because I, I, uh, I'll get to the other topic later. It, uh, there's more more than I want to cover. Yeah, yeah. just a conversation. Yeah, that, 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 um, 348. There we go. Oh, so, oh. so like this, this is, I, I, I saw this one come up and I'm sitting there going, like, you know, this was what the quintessential like Ferrari for us coming up, right? You have the Tarosa, you have 348, you have the 355. Yeah. Uh, and the 348 was that bridge in between the 355 and Test the rest of the 512. And you're looking at the price. It's going for what, 61 now? So are you sitting here and buying this car? Or are you going a little bit more modern and getting yourself into like a, a manual 360 or maybe even you know, paying a little bit more and getting into a 430? So I just, I don't see, although how good these are to look at, I can't justify buying it. Because you know it's not, it's, as far as I'm aware, and I've been around these pretty pretty often. The maintenance cost and the upkeep on these is horrendous. Yeah, so that's what I was going to ask. So I, I know very little to nothing about these uh, in particular, but I've always appreciated. I always love them. Uh, but I've seen them go for like sixty-one thousand for for something like that. So, okay, it seems interesting. Um, but that was always my question. I'm like, what, what does the maintenance and drivability on these look like? Because I've had a couple friends that have had them. Um, whether it's this one or 360. Um, and then actually one of the neighbors just got a Testarossa a few months back. Uh, I need to go talk to him. But, but every single person I've talked to that's had them says just the maintenance and just the, the, the usability of them is awful. They've always had them in the shop. Um, and it, it just was something they were dealing with nonstop. Um, so it, at that point, is it worth seventy-five to spend another fifty thousand at the dealer constantly getting it fixed and repaired? I mean, how many how many places? Maybe maybe in Orange County, you might have a few mechanics here that you can do this. A few, you still have a few Ferrari dealerships that will, will still service these. They they do a pretty good job of yeah. servicing stuff that's old. But I mean, like this one in particular, it's got 33,000 miles, so you know it was driven. But out of that, how much did the maintenance cost? That's that's what I would like to know on that one. So if you broke down your maintenance cost per mile, I think that one requires a 30,000 mile service. See. Somewhere around there. It, it is beautiful. So this, the which one was the cruising exotic one? You had the, that was the Testarossa, right? Yes, uh, I think I don't think it was just this one. Um, Let's see. Uh, it's a chiropractor's office. This has to be like a chiropractor or maybe like a general GP that hasn't moved over to like a a big uh, hospital yet. It so, looks so. Uh, it's it's a it's a good looking car, right? But. Oh, so the good. first major yeah. service, from what I'm seeing, is around ten thousand miles, and that's at sixty eight hundred dollars. So I just say it's every ten thousand miles. So you're looking yeah. at what? Uh, well, so this one's already sitting at twenty grand on the thirty thousand miles that it's had, right? Like minimum. So yeah, so say it had three services, three of those sixty eight hundred mile services, right? You're yeah. looking at. It's costing you sixty-two cents a mile to drive that car. Nice. And on yeah. top of on top of what you're paying now with inflated gas prices, yeah, and uh, everything else. I, I don't think insurance is probably too too cheap on this too because you got two seats. No, it's a, it's a sports car, right? So it's an older one, but it's a Ferrari still. So you're, you're probably paying so it kind of goes to my amount. thing. Who's buying us? Who's who's saying they're buying us? The guy that doesn't know any better. Like, like me, if I didn't have you to talk this through, <laughs> right? Like I'd be like, oh, okay. You know, it's reasonable. Let's, let's, let's try this out. And then I'd take it to the, the dealer for the first time and be like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, oh man, look at that. I yeah. just love that. I love the design. This was, this was some of the greatest, um, just era of design, car design. It was so fun. I don't know. They're fun, yeah. It's just like beautiful. Nobody, nobody cared about how it ran and how you know well it ran and how 
How long it ran for? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) As long as it broke down and it looked good, you're fine. Yeah. Oh, man. Look at that. Look look how tall that shifter is right there. I know. I know. You you wouldn't even grab the shifter. You'd be grabbing, like, the the shaft on it, right? Like, (laughs) to to shift it, it'd be like a short shifter. (laughs) Yeah. Uh. Granted, I, I would still love to drive one of these. But, you know... It's just my question of like who's spending the money? Are they actually gonna drive this or they put it away? What what is their the rest of their collection look like? Yeah, I mean maybe this, maybe 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 you have maybe you have two of them, right? Like you because the guy the guy that's buying the three hundred thousand dollar like McLaren or something probably isn't buying this unless he's buying it for his collection. Like he's like, Hey, I love these as a kid. Um I want one now. And I have four or five, 10 other cars. Let me have it as part of the, the stable. Um, so there's probably that guy. Um, and then there's probably the guy that's like, hey, I've always wanted a Ferrari. He might even just be retired or something, but he can't really spend two, 300,000 on something. And uh, maybe to him at 75, this looks attractive, but he is definitely gonna be a bad holder and uh, he's yeah. not gonna sell it for any more. And um, it's one of those things that looks attractive until you try to do it. And then you either barely make any money or you lose money on it. And then you're like, crap, why did I do that? Um, so I think the only, the only way you buy this is if you just want it for your collection and you don't mind parking, you know, 70, 80, 100,000. Um, but it, there's just, it, there is something beautiful to this. I mean, it'd be fun to have. Um, but it definitely wouldn't be a, a money making thing. I mean, you saw, and it was it, the market actually is pretty set. There have been a bunch of bunch of them turned over, and it looks like the range is pretty steady from like sixty to hundred, depending on like hundred. You had to be like real low mileage, real clean, and then um, and then you had to be at sixty. You might pick one up, and, and it might need some work. Um, so, so you see that one ends in what nineteen hours or something like that? that- the, What's that? This one ends in 19 hours, right? So it ends tomorrow oh. at some point. Right. The, the option. And it's at 61. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's just say that one ends at 75. Let's just let's be generous and say it's going to be a 75 marker. Um, I don't know what they finished that before, but uh, I'm going to say somewhere in the 75 range for that mileage. I, I think it's perfect, yeah. So at 75, are you spending an extra five, maybe 10 grand buying yourself a 360, which you know is significantly more reliable? But does, does the guy know that? Like, do, do the people that, do the people, do the people that are like worried about spending the extra couple bucks or not spending a couple extra bucks are, are like, do, are they aware? Like you have the hardcore collector that might, might be into this stuff that might, collect them and in that case he might not care he might want this version specifically uh and then you have the guy that's like so let's, you let's know. break it down this way break it down like this if you had you already know that the 360 is more reliable than the 348 you're looking at both of them okay so if you pull up the 360 and then compare the looks which one are you going for I remember the 360 ride. I, I, I do like those. Well, mm, eh. 430. I'm like, well, mm, that's not bad. That's not bad. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay away from the challenge because uh, that, that one is, is especially sexy. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, you pony up a couple. But, but, but that's actually double the price, right? Like essentially you're, well, you're that, paying up 40, 50 grand. Like it's not, it's not jump change. So that, that one in particular, yeah. So like right now on, on like car gurus, you have them with 36,000 miles, essentially the same mileage as 348 with uh, going for about 90, hmm. you know? So you have one with 27,000 miles going for 89. So what year? Wise alone, uh, they were both 99s. Okay, because this one's 3K99. I'm like, is there some arbitrage we're like finding as we're talking about this? I'm like, (laughs) oh, yeah, the challenge is a different story. But looks wise, what are you going with? Okay, so here, here, yeah, they are bid to, you got 70, 
mid seventies, even bit here, not selling, but. Hmm. Um, I don't know, man, the, the, the three forty eight just, it's a different generation of cars, 10 years younger, right? Like it's, it's a different, it's, it's a guy, the guy, the guy is 10 years older. The guy that's buying this is 10 years older. He's, he's the guy that was like in high school that like saw this thing and saw like whoever drove this in some movie or something like that. And he's like, I want that one. Like, it's the same reason why, uh, you know, guys our age are buying like Fast and the Furious cars. You don't buy like a 2005 Civic. It might run better than like a 98 or whatever was in Fast and Furious, but that was the one you were buying, right? You're, you're not buying an yeah. RX-8, you're buying an RX-7. You're buying like, like there's, I think it's just a different buyer. The guy that's going back and buying this, is probably buying it for for more more for nostalgia than he's buying it for like a like a performance car. Because um, at yeah, the end of the day, yeah. you're, you're gonna spend you're gonna spend seventy grand on a car. You might as well go buy like a super, right? Like yeah. agreed. That, that's a to- again, that's a totally different buyer. Yeah. But it's just it's one of those things where I'm sitting here going like, as buying a supercar, an old supercar. I just I can't figure out why you'd want to buy that unless it's the nostalgia, like you're saying. Other than, I kind of would buy it too, just as it looks really nice. I mean, th- this guy, this guy looks like he sold penny stocks to people right before the market collapsed, and they all lost their shirt, and he made off like a bandit. Like that's so he, <laughs> that's the stockbroker car, right? Like <laughs> he for sure wears loafers with no socks to get his mail and drive yeah. his Ferrari. Yeah. yeah, this is that's, that's this, for sure. This is, is also. This is also probably the same guy that's buying uh, that's buying eighteen hundred dollar, forty seven hundred dollar, and thirteen thousand dollar three forty eight Ferrari luggage. Um, you have to have the luggage so you have a complete car. Have you have you have you, ever paid att- have you ever seen the Concorde stuff? Like, you'll get knocked for not having the luggage to the car. I'm sorry, what? So, so, like, if you look at concourse, like, all those concourse uh, winning cars, they will have, like, the set of luggage that went with the car. If it's on the MSRP or the, the window sticker and you don't have it, you get points knocked off the, the, oh, the completion wow. of the car. So a lot of these guys are buying this. Well, I would say a majority, I would think, are buying it to do the completion of the car, saying, like, I have a 348, nice low mileage. This is the uh, suitcases that went with it. Because it's not those aren't serialized or anything that I know of, but if it's on the sticker, then you have the complete package now. So, so you you remember like when you were growing up and like I, I don't know about you, but like I played a lot of video games and like RPGs and stuff, and uh, like your character, you'd be like searching for like armor, or, like sets of stuff, right? And then your yeah. parents would be screaming and you like telling you like this is never going to teach you anything in life. These motherfuckers grow up to do the exact same thing. <laughs> But with real items and Ferrari parts, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> okay, I got the 348. Now I need the Ferrari 348 luggage because it's going to make my whole set. It has some synergy. It's going to make it worth more. <laughs> uh, it's, it's what they're thinking. I'm sitting there going, like, what are you doing? Why? I mean, man, power to you. If you can, if you if you if you can afford thirteen thousand dollar luggage for five sets, uh, no thanks. For, Five pieces, good, good for you. That's. Uh, I wonder what did the comments on this have to be good. I'm lost for words. I will retreat. Oh. Enjoy my barbed wire collection. Oh my god! Look for the black set, coming up soon. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's it, there. There's maybe one or two people like you and I in here just dropping just asinine comments to bother people. Oh, I'd be doing it all over the place here if I if I knew that this would <laughs> this was live. But these people are really excited about it. Yeah. Well, it came what up on the streamer, right? Oh, so see, there's somebody like us. Will it fit in my Yugo? <laughs> uh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, going going back to the uh, the repair shop uh, shop thing. So um, I got I got a I got a new suspension put on the Hummer, right? Yeah. And um, so it was there for like uh, a week. Um, Hummercore takes very good care of me. I'm very, very happy with them. Um, 
start to start to finish, even dealing with them after the fact, it's been great. Um, but it was it was funny. Like uh, a couple of weeks later, I noticed uh, the pump for the the air suspension keeps kind of pumping up and then shutting off for thirty seconds. I look at the controller and it's saying that there's a leak. So I go to try to find it, can't find it. Um, I, I narrowed it down to where it was coming from. It was coming from the front shocks, but the two places that it could possibly be leaking from, I couldn't find it. Uh, but that's not the issue. Uh, the issue was uh, at this point, I, re I realized now I'm going to have to explain to my wife why I have to take my car that's constantly in the shop <laughs> back. And I need a ride. <laughs> I need a ride. I, that, that's really the, the end. So she looks at me and goes, really? I'm like, yeah. She's like, you're not going to have it for four weeks. You, I'm like, you, no, I'm, I'm going to get back. It might, I might get back tomorrow. Sure you enough, back. A half mile from there. So you can get away with taking it, not, not getting shit for it. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't want, yeah. You know, you got baby. I, I didn't want to bug yeah. you. But, uh, but that was, that was the, I was just like, that was the hardest part, part of the whole thing. I'm like, so you know that this guy, same thing. He, he, this guy bought this thing for 75000 He's going to take it home. He's going to drive it. He's going to take his lady on a nice uh, date. And then uh, and then a week later, he's going to be like, hey, babe, I have to take it back to the shop. And she's going to be like, it was in service for three weeks. It cost you $8,000. Like, yeah, I know. But now, you know, the AC fan's not working. And it's not cool. Or, you know, the, uh, the radiator is leaking or something. And, and that's going to be the journey over question. and over. But, yeah, you're right. But uh, yeah, remember when you were driving and I was teaching you how to drive the Ferrari? Well, you burned through the clutch. Congratulations. Um, you know, I know the key to that shot. is when you feel that it's starting to slip, when you already get the first slippage of it because you were, you were screwing it up, you teach them to drive it and be like, well, it happened when you were driving it. Because yes, I was teaching now you. I'm not, now I have to get a new one. So, uh, there you so go. yeah, I, th I think, but that's one of those things that I think I, some people are okay with. Like I'm personally okay with it. I deal with it every now and then. Um, yeah. I know you you would be too because that's just something you you accept as 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 having an older car. Your car's sixteen years old. Your car's uh, 30, 32 years old. Like you're you're gonna deal with this, um, but it's not for everybody. <laughs> um, no. So that 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 guy better be prepared for it. And, and at least my my services aren't expensive. Like actually, because there's a lot of interchangeability with GM and Duramax and and Allison. Um, like there's there's a lot of uh, inexpensive parts available and the labor is actually not that expensive uh, for, yeah. for, for, the uh, for a Ferrari. Uh, pretty sure the tech there is making like $800 an hour. So, uh, and, and probably working on the side as a lawyer. So, um, you know, you better be prepared, prepared for that. It's a good point you have. It's, it's something I don't think people think about when they invest in like these older cars, you know, like the Hummer, that's a, it's a great investment one two it's a good investment because if something goes south on it you know that it's an affordable fix it's an everyday fix essentially there's plenty of chevy 2500 duramaxes out there with there's plenty of allison transmissions out there very few parts are singular to your car to the hummer 348 you know that's a different story you get like a lamborghini countach of the same area or a diablo very limited a maserati even further right because of what it is so I, I don't think people think about that so now you're talking my language so actually and, and the reason like this per, this particular ferrari and, and actually most ferraris don't really scratch that itch for me um but dude you 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 pull up like a 90s diablo or a, uh, oh, like yeah. a 90s Countach. Ooh, we're having a different conversation, but it's a very different price point, right? Like you're you're not seeing uh, Diablos or Countaches go for sixty, seventy, eighty thousand. Like those are all going for three hundred, four hundred thousand now. So, but those those, ooh, yeah, that that to me that to me would be that car. And you're like, okay, I I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna put up with this labor of pain of dealing with you always at the dealership and everything else because uh, because you're you're worth it type of thing. There is a Lamborghini out there that, like, I think kind of qualifies in this one. It's a seventies one. I don't remember what it is, but people like are buying it on the regular. Um, well, I don't say regular, but people do buy it. I forget what it is, but ah, uh, you would you would be a sucker that would buy it. Yeah, yeah, and and that and that's not that's not my era of car, right? Like this this was the car that I was playing with as a kid. 
like it was the, it was actually a white one hard top i think i'm pretty sure it was a hard top uh with a big sv logo on the side here and like that was that was that oh, yeah. you know that was a supercar for me that was like my first exposure to it uh the, the well, we beautiful, who, but it's a whole different car who's so what, what, who's a seller for that car can you see what, uh, who's the seller know? yeah yeah uh i think this is the costa mesa car, uh seller yeah yeah they're up uh yeah costa mesa silver cars yeah, we all we already know who took those pictures yeah yeah, but those those are those are great cars. Those are fun. But it gives you that same nostalgia. And I don't think I'm curious to how many people noticed what those air intakes look like on the on the hood. On on the on the right Yeah. What are you talking about? The ones the ones right there below the windshield. Mm -hmm. How they're like horned hoods, horned mm -hmm. air suits. I don't think a lot of people, I don't know if that was an intentional design from Lamborghini, but like oh, I, don't, goal thing. I don't think I ever noticed that actually. That's wow. That's an interesting point. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of like a bull bull, like facing their, their horns forward. Huh? Yeah. I don't know <laughs> if Lamborghini was that intricate at that time about doing Oh, that. I'm sure they were, man. But yeah. Oh, this is a great era of cars with these type of lights too, right? The flip up lights. You got the you got the one winking headlight and then the other one that just stays stuck and then you go over there and give it a little love tap and it pops back open. Is it is it transferring over on the screen? Are you seeing are you seeing it? Uh the, the pictures no, or are you just seeing it? I'm still seeing, seeing, a... I'm oh. still seeing the uh, Diablo. How weird. Uh oh, wait, let's see. How bad here. Let me No, because it looked it looked like it was stuck on that, that picture too here. Let's see. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Let me tell you this. Having slip up headlights is really cool for about a month. Until they break? Then, until they break. My Trans Am had the flip up headlights. And low mileage, well serviced. I went through it and then randomly, like a piece of dirt got in there with the gears and the synchros. And that was it. Yeah. And I had to take out the entire assembly to put it back in there to have it happen like three months down the road again. This car is just so iconic. Yeah. This, this is this is my my childhood supercar. Oh man. So it, it's worth like if if you could buy if I could buy a five hundred thousand dollar car, this would be worth every penny to me. Not not the maintenance beside it. So that's how I feel like that the guy that's buying a three forty forty eight. So I kind of like whatever I'll put up with it because you know it's it's what I want. Like I, it could be a hunk of metal sitting in my driveway and it would be fine. 4,900 miles on that thing. Yeah, he's just he's just before the first service. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's, 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 he's made yeah. it since 98. He's like, okay, I'm uh, yeah, but I just really I've don't want to take dealer. <laughs> I waited 30 years to get here. I'm going to sell it before the first major service. Here you go. Oil changes are good. Brakes are good. Done. Oh, man. What a beauty. Uh, it's kind of kind of getting away from it, though. Um, oh, what, was, what was the other one you had? Uh, you had up for us here. Yeah. Oh, this is this is coming out of nowhere. You no, know, so I was I was sitting there going, I was looking on Craigslist and everywhere like to buy some cars to like flip. And you know, I came across the Dodge Stealth and I totally forgot that they had the turbo, right? Everybody everybody's super hooked on the um the three thousand GT. Mm -hmm. Remember the VR four? But yeah, yeah. Everybody forgets that the Dodge Stealth RT Turbo is the same exact car. They had a deal going back then with Mitsubishi to be able to sell this in the States. Because initially the 3000 GT, the VR4, was only for Japan. And they said, no problem. Go ahead and start selling that to Dodge. They launched them at the same time. The, I think, stickers for the VR4 was 44. This one was 34. Why are you not buying this? Same interior, same power. Everything's the same except the body. And I'm just yeah. like, such a steal. Well, even such even a... the body, even the body kind of looks very similar, right? Like you have, um, like I, I actually thought this was a 3000 GT initially, because um, it kind of has that look, right? Like I mean, 3000 GT had, uh, yeah. 
Very similar look. This is kind of like an RX-7, maybe a Miata 3000 GT. It's like that whole series of car, right? Like this is what it made yes. one. So that, yeah. yeah. The whole, whole blend of it. I think they sold these up until 94, but the, the, the Mitsubishi ran until late 90s, maybe early 2000s, somewhere around there. But I think this so, is one of those super cool cars that just everybody forgot about. So why... So, so the the seventies, the early seventies was kind of like the the heyday for for uh, the the American muscle cars. Then the emissions stuff came out. Late seventies yeah. and eighties cars just are terrible, right? Like their the de design on them was like, hey, we're going to make these functional and efficient because we can't do cool stuff with the engines anymore. Um, and they all look terrible for the most part. Like, yeah, there's probably one or two that, that look all right, but. Um, but then, like the early '90s, you, you started seeing a bunch of really cool cars coming out of Japan, um, Ferraris and, and Lambos, and a lot of the exotics started getting interesting. Um, American cars in the early '90s still sucked, right? I mean, there wasn't anything really too interesting until until later. Uh, both you didn't have anything in the '90s. You had what? You had the IROC Z, then you had the Super Sport. For Camaros, and you had the Trans Am, the WS6. You had the Fox body Mustangs, and then you went into I don't know what they called you, the next body. Yeah, like the Firebirds and stuff, like the Pontiac and stuff that were pretty neat looking, right? Yeah, um, they were different. The, those are '90s. Those are '90s cars, but like late late '90s maybe. Um, but yeah, no, there, there was this like shift where cars started kind of getting cool again, right? Like because the '80s just just completely ate up, ate it all up. Um, and then there were a couple of companies that made stuff like this where you, well, I mean, companies do this all the time, right? Like you have a, you have a sister company or you have a company that, um, that, that uses parts from, uh, another brand that the, the, the parent company owns. I mean, um, I, what IS 330 or IS 300 has the two JZ in it. Um, yeah. it's Toyota Supra. Like <laughs> you might as well, like uh, th those are still cool, pretty cool to buy up and, and fix up. So, uh, BRZ and uh, what is it, the Subaru, the, the, Subaru the, BRZ and the, the other one that they had, the two. The, two. the Scion. Whatever yeah. It oh, Scion. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Still coming. Have, I think so. I don't really pay attention to them. But, yeah. you know, you have, well, think of what Mercedes and AMG did. You know, you have, or not uh, Mercedes and AMG. Yeah. You know, AMG and uh, Aston. You know, they're using the same engines. So yeah. the Aston road cars are using the, the AMG uh, road car engines. But Audi, Audi, Audi Lambo and stuff too. Like uh, the uh, the most terrible car, like the the Gallardo that the, the Lamborghinis ever made, and uh, the uh, well, already... made one really good one. They made one really good one. Yeah, one. and the, and the, and the R eight. Um, I'll, I'll give you that, but but uh, but. Uh, but no, they, they, you have the Gallardo and they, you have the uh, RA, uh, Audi. Uh, it's basically the same car, right? Like they, they almost look the same. Why would you not buy the RA and why would you buy the Gallardo if, if you probably, the price difference there was probably significant too, right? Um, it, was, it was a pretty big difference, but the thing is the Audi had way nicer features on the inside. It was just more comfortable, better looking. Um, it was less expensive, right? Less expensive because you, you had the V8 in the first R8s. And then I think a second, like the 0.2 gens had the, the V10 option. But the V10, I don't think came in a manual. Whereas I think some Gallardos did. Have you ever sat in one of these? Like ever in your life as a child or anything? Like the back seat there? One the of those? back seat, yes. bucket seat things. Yeah. I, I, I spent a trip to Vegas in traffic like seven hours in the back of one of those ones. It was a, it was a, it was a prelude, the Honda prelude right. with like bucket seats like this, black one. And my buddy, we were in uh, his dad's car, and his dad's like six five, looks like Lionel Richie, and he was driving. And my buddy was sitting in front of me, and I was sitting in the back here. And we were like 14, 15 years old, and uh, it was awful. Never well, they're, not, they're, they're for looks. That's why they're for insurance. <laughs> yeah, it's for insurance plus two. It's not necessarily we don't put anybody in it still. 
Yeah. This one seems like it's, it's nice. Like, yeah, it seems like it's in decent condition, but it's. I just saw it the other day and I was like, you know what, man? I, I think people kind of forgot about these. These are such fun cars. You have you have over three hundred horsepower in the early nineties. That's actually impressive. Uh, That's very impressive. I think it was three three hundred and twenty horsepower, three hundred and fifteen foot pounds of torque. Um, right, right in that range, somewhere, somewhere right around there. I appreciate that it's fairly, it looks very stock. Like to keep a car this long and not modify the heck out of it, a car like this is very impressive. Think, yeah, and the thing too is, is, say if you're buying this now, what is that one going for? That one's, that one's up there in price. It, it went for twenty five five. Okay, yeah, the VR fours pull a little bit more money, but man, you you had a turbo car back then, so you had endless amounts of potential with it. Yeah, so you even have ones go for ten grand. Are they all twin turbos? Yeah. Okay, so something like this that's for ninety five hundred bucks, sixty three thousand miles TMU though. Ooh. Oh, yeah. yeah, but you're buying that one because you're going to build it out. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm curious about is if you, because the bodies look so similar, what if you bought a whole body kit for a 3000 GT and just buy yourself a stealth and just put the body paneling of a 3000 GT on it? Dude, I mean, look, this is almost the same car. Yeah, there you go. I mean, it, you know, it, it looks almost identical. Does it have that short, stubby wing that was kind of moved forward? No, too? the 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 VR fours had a long wing all the way across. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But by now, they probably are unlimited parts for it. If not, you could probably make them. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, look at there's there's no difference in there. The way the interiors look, the way the exteriors look. I mean, slight, but not enough. Yeah, it's just. Oh, it's a nice looking car. Yeah, I think it's one of those ones that one of those hidden gems that we kind of tend to forget about. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I feel about the uh that's how I feel about the Z, man. Like you take you take I take it out right now. It's still it still feels like it's on rails. Uh it's well balanced, the dimensions are good. I mean, just it's it's just a it sounds real nice. Uh it's very predictable. It feels very good sideways. <laughs> but uh it's just an underrated, inexpensive car, um, and and something like this, something like this. So it's like the guy that the guy is that's going to own this now, or that's going to buy this now, uh, is buying it for that reason because they know. Like I'm on my third Z, like they they know yeah. what what this is and why they're buying it, and and this thing that's that's pretty impressive, dude. Like 300 horsepower, 307 foot pounds of torque okay. when new. In, in the early nineties, like you said, that's, that's unbelievable. Like that thing, that thing had to be the, the, like almost like a, like a Corvette of its era type of thing. You had a supercar for right? supercar prices in the early nineties. Right. right. I wonder, I, um, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I just, I just think it's a solid, solid car that people Tend to forget about people forget about the Mitsubishi a little bit just because they forget about the brand itself. Uh, but yeah. Easy, easy to do, but they actually had some home runs, right? Like they have the they have this one, uh, yeah. they have the Evo, Eclipse. Uh, yeah. the Eclipse actually was another big one. That's right. Um, and there was an all-wheel drive turbo version of the Eclipse, I think, too. If, if not, if not, there was definitely an all-wheel drive. There was definitely an all-wheel drive version. I don't know if there was a turbo version, but um, seems like that would make sense. I mean, they have this one in turbo. They have a yeah. Eagle. Seems like they would probably have had that out. But, um, but no, they they they've made some they've made some awesome cars. I just don't think of them as a being like a. I never liked the interiors much. They always felt very kind of cheap. Well, they look boxy. Look at that. Looks like a boat chair. Yeah, but. Oh, it's a neat looking car. Um, so along with having like old, older cars and, and the Hummers, no different, I found myself thinking um, kind of early on when I got it, um, I should probably like sit and let it, let it warm up for a little while, right? Like 
not only is the engine not brand new, but it's got to get lubricated, and 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 I, I really don't yeah. want to do anything I can to to, to speed up its its uh, demise. Although when that happens, ultimately it uh, it'll be fun to build up. Um, but I kind of went and uh, uh, was was diving into hey, how long, what's appropriate. Um, so it seems like um, what I, what I found from um, uh, who did I find from? Consumer Reports they they, they did uh, a report on it um, because if fuel injected cars coming about in the nineties, um, they, you only need to give them about 30 seconds to kind of really get fuel and oil and everything kind of moved around through the system, um, to, to, to be able to kind of put it in drive and take off. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting cause like a, a diesel diesel, even on the newer ones, the, the, a lot of the, the documentation recommends uh, about three minutes of idle before driving. Um, and I would actually also add in like our motorcycles, um, since we have a heat gauge and it's very, very clear, especially when, well, a bike made in the last 20 years, uh, you have a digital heat gauge, right? So I don't, I don't so much as rev it until it hits about a hundred degrees, uh, operating temperature from mine is about 165. Um, so I'll really wait till about 130, 140 to be able to get on it. Uh, but I won't, you know, start riding until it's about a hundred. Um, so I, I don't know if that's ever even come into consideration for you. Uh, but I found myself thinking like the Z and, and, uh, and the, uh, the Hummer and, and the motorcycle, like I'm, I'm consciously aware of that all the time. Although the Hummer actually has a whole startup procedure between filling up the tires and, and, and getting the engine warmed up and everything. So. No, yeah. But I have dude on everything just out of habit, you know, like when with the CBR, I would do the same thing. I'd play in an extra amount of time because I knew I was going to let it sit there and warm up. Go in there, turn it on, let it sit, finish getting ready. By the time I came out, it was sitting at 120, 130, and then I could start going from there. Same with basically every car I've ever owned. You know, when I had the F350, it was, you know, I think your Hummer has the glow plug, right? You, you put an accessory right. with the glow plug to heat up, crank yep. on, same thing. And it's like, and I think I've always been curious if it had to do more with the idea that those cars are generally under load and that was the purpose of it so they want you to really warm it up mm. so that three minute cautionary is just hey you're gonna be towing something don't be an asshole like let's make sure that you prep the car correctly or it's legitimate for getting everything lubed getting all the gaskets compressed again you know that kind of thing yeah no i still do it. i still do it with the white spray new car i sit there turn it on wait a minute Wait till the revs die down again, then go. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's a practice that's probably not used nearly enough anymore. But, but uh, de definitely as the older the cars get, I, I find myself being like, okay, I should probably give this give the sample amount of time. But apparently, if it's uh, it's not fuel injected, you you definitely need to give it give it some appropriate time. Oh yeah, to be able to warm up. Which I, I didn't know that was the distinction. It was like, hey, if it's a if it's a gasoline engine car uh, and you have fuel injection, thirty seconds is enough. And, and that, that seemed pretty consistent uh, through what I found. Um, but uh, if it's uh, if it's pre nineties or if it's a diesel or something like that, I give it ample amount of time, especially if it's cold. Um, so probably a little bit more is better than a little bit less. Um, but I guess newer cars are pretty tolerant about it. But um, I think the just, only way you got away with away with it without fuel injection was like if you had uh, one of the electrified um, carburetors where it helped kind of one heat up and two um it was sitting there providing a more consistent flow the carburation if mm. like my 68 mustang if i if i took off literally five seconds too soon it would just cut out it just it was not happy I'm like, it's like no i ain't ready yeah, no i put it i put it in the gear and it cut out and i'm like and i know a lot of people are gonna sit there and say oh it's because it wasn't tuned right well well it was heavily the carb was heavily tuned but it just once it got into a good operating temperature, it never gave me any issues. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, I think the other thing I, I got to thinking, um, I don't know how much you've been following like the last couple of months or whatever, Mar market's really been like stocks and stuff have been really, really not doing well. Um, housing seems to be holding up, um, but lately their crypto has just, just gotten obliterated too. Bitcoin's <laughs> tested under 30,000 got to pretty close to 20 um and there's a lot of stuff happening in that universe um 
how why well, I want to bring that up. Um, there's a lot of people that you see or you used to see at Cars and Coffee uh, that that used to have you know McLarens and real nice high end toys. Um, I almost feel like I'm seeing less and less now. Um, yeah. But I got to I, I was always wondering. I'm like, I wonder how many of these are are going to be out on auction when uh, <laughs> uh, you know the things if, if things ever do retreat. Um, and, and I don't. I didn't want to bring this up to, to debate crypto or anything like that. I think I think there's there's good and bad there, but um, I'm just kind of wondering with with uh, with a lot of the cars uh, and the froth that was used to purchase a lot of these vehicles. Um, there was a, a I didn't realize there's a, there's a, a Mannheim used vehicle value index that was a, that tracks the used used car vehicle prices along with a lot of other metrics. Um, I'll throw it up here, and um, and they 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 recently had their uh, the biggest. Let me see here. Uh, they 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 recently actually finally had uh, a tick down on uh, on used car prices. Is that the one? No. Yeah, yeah. No, I know what you're talking about. It, it happened about uh, a couple of weeks ago. It started happening actually a little bit further out than that. But it's so Mannheim is one of those companies that has a monopoly on that used car market. Um, it's Cox Automotive, they're, they're massive. So they have a pretty ex extensive reach. Oh, Odds gotcha. are if, if you bought a used car from a, a, a dealership, um, you're buying something that was purchased from a Mannheim auction. Um, that's how that's how deep their, their roots are in that, in that game. I think they just, to kind of go further into how much control they have on pricing, they own Auto Trader and Kelly Blue Book, I believe. Oh Lord! So, huh? I said, Oh Lord! Yeah. So they they're they're pretty deep in there. So yeah, there's. I think Thanks. you said it right before. It's like, it's the froth, right? All these guys have bought bought on the froth. They never let that beer settle, and then figure out where they're really sitting. So you're going to oh. see a big drop off, and you're already starting to see in the the, the McLaren and uh, Baby Lambo market, a lot of stuff is popping up used. Uh, the G Wagon market, a lot of stuff is popping up used. Uh, yeah. because these guys are just aren't these people aren't holding on to them in anticipation of the money that they've some you know under assumption lost in that arena uh it's what sucks that's what that's what screwed the whole car market up if you see that spike that you're showing from january 2021 to january 2022 you have a couple factors there right you have um, the chip shortage that increased the value of the the used car, but you also have these early money buy early money gainers that sat there and said, "Dude, I just made five hundred thousand dollars on a, a monkey." So or YouTube so, or YouTube or or something else. But but this was also the time where you had the the Fed dump like yep. seven trillion dollars in the economy, and so now they're calling it back and they're calling it back aggressively between the IRS and the and the and the the, the Fed themselves through uh, interest rates. So that I don't see being, you know, going higher. There's no way. And it's, it's a so, huge component of uh, inflation, actually. I use yeah. used car prices uh, and labor, I think are the two biggest contributors to uh, uh, the, the CPI data that we, no, is it, is it labor and CPI? I don't know, but uh, yeah. used car price is definitely a huge yeah. contributor to CPI, which the Fed uses to track inflation. Um, so it's interesting. I, I, I'm curious how this affects a lot of the options and stuff. It's interesting that you said Cox Automotive is the one that, or like it's on the graph, uh, how they're the ones that control a lot of this. Um, so I wonder how this is going to go into their models now that you have like bat and your cars and bids, uh, hopefully collectors bid too. You have, um, you have a lot of these these uh, markets that are very transparent, very visible. Uh, Bat does a great job of showing you all the prices that, that all the cars went for. Um, so you can kind of make a market, uh, or you can see how a, a market is made in those uh, in, a, in a particular car. Um, what's reasonable, what's not, and make a make a pretty decent assessment. Um, so I, I wonder if they're worried about having those those type of companies out there those type of auctions out there that, that 
um, also where the, a lot of trading is going on, at least from the collector's element, you know, guys, they're collecting these. So like the, the problem you have with, with a graph like this, and like, I don't know where they're getting all, they're pulling all their information from is it's, it, it tends to be a little bit skewed like on the perception of somebody like like ourselves who are looking at two different markets right so you have that uh, supercar hypercar and collector car market and then you have the everyday market which is you know, your standard stuff your f-150s your honda civics your you know, regular e-class mercedes those those are the ones that tend to fluctuate significantly with the way the economy is doing and the way you know whatever the fed is putting out there the higher end stuff anything in the, the 200,000 and above range tends to not take that big of a hit from people who are already established in that wealth arena right so i think that to a degree that pricing is going to take a little bit of a hit with what's going on but not as much as everything below it that makes sense yeah i think so it's 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 just a weird way to look at it because when i would sit there and buy cars you know, the one thing that was always doing well was the high end cars. And look at what's happened over the past two, three years, right? Everything's gone up, down, side to side. But all of a sudden you have higher production in Ferraris, higher production in Lamborghinis, more limited editions coming out. You're seeing Koenig's eggs left and right. So that isn't generally as affected as, you know, an entry level, level Lambo, an entry level Porsche, entry level Ferrari because of what's going on. Okay. Well, that's pro that's probably the market that's hurt the most. Um, you 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 have those those guys that are just reaching far enough to get that entry level Lambo or something, and then they're the ones probably hurt the most by everything yeah. that's going on. And then then they're like, oh crap, I got to get rid of this real quick before uh, uh, second so I can pay other bills. Uh, this this graph was also from that that same site. We'll we'll link this in the description uh, below. Uh, but it uh, has the changes of prices. Um, for the particular car so you have uh, uh this is year over year so from from april 2021 to to april 2022 it just happened um it's interesting that pickups didn't move um i suspect that that's probably because you had this huge appreciation in pickups when the the um when a lot of money got dumped and and you did have a, a, a huge acceleration of uh, construction and everything happening um i'd be curious to see what this looked like uh, on a year over year change comparing April 2020 to, to April to, uh, 2021, because you probably have pickups drastically outperforming everybody else here. Um, at least that's that's what I would think. My, my other intuition was that pickups aren't EV yet, and there's there there isn't that like hyper super attractive model that there, there's the F 150, you know, that or 1500 Silverado or something that people are buying that. Uh, or Ram 1500 that uh, that the guys have always bought, and they probably are buying the new one because they, the the old the old one's old, and they're taking it to the shop more. Uh, probably not for any other reason. Um, it's not because you know Tesla has some new one out that that they want to buy or something. Like that. It's not the the market. Um, but now with the EV pickups too, I'm I'm pretty sure that there's probably going to be a drastic uh, uh, uptick. In, in in this particular number too, um, if if for nothing else because of the uh, scarcity of their release, I mean we just we we, we spoke in the beginning uh, about Rivian and and how they're going for fifty grand more more, um, you know this is this is a this is going to change big time uh, uh, to next year probably. Yeah, I think it was, it's going to be kind of a speed one because I think the pickup truck market is somebody who sits there and buys it. It's a purpose purchased vehicle, right? So they are spending, you know, 70, 80 grand on their F350s, but they have a lot of trust in it versus the EV that they hasn't quite been scrutinized in the level of driving it on a construction site, putting a payload in it. So I don't know if it's going to have that much of a change in it other than what's going on with some of the trucks that we see selling. So that that's interesting. My, my one pushback, and maybe it's, it's actually an aside, it's not directly going after that. I think you do have a component there. And you also have the people that are like, I remember watching the F-150 release and how many comments yeah. there were about like, uh, just make my my gasoline truck, blah, 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 blah. Like people were really, there were, there were some people that were very much adamant, like 
I don't want anything to do with EVs. Okay, fine. You'll you'll come around. It's fine. You, you'll you'll see the, the the use case, and maybe you won't, and or you don't have use for it. Great. Enjoy the other one. Um, but uh, there's uh, uh, there's also the a aspect that the the government. I, I think it's two thirds of uh, government vehicles are all trucks. Uh, National yeah. Forest Service, a lot of the uh, construction stuff, wh whatever. There's a lot of government vehicles that are, that are pickup trucks, specifically uh, Ford pickup trucks for the most part. Um, and uh, so you're going to have a forced adoption of a lot of these electric vehicle trucks, or at the very least, hybrid trucks uh, that are going to be out rolling out to meet the, the yeah. mandates that are being set right now by politicians. Yeah. Uh, because they want to accomplish, you know, uh, uh, by 2030, they want them all to be hybrid or electric. Um, I'm actually surprised how, how much that hybrid conversation just kind of completely died. And it's been like hardcore, like we only want type of EV. There's been a very hard push to like only talking about EV where hybrid to me actually makes a lot more sense. Um, but, uh, EV is convenient to talk about right now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's a good uh, political talking talking point probably right, right. Um, but uh, but you're going to have this forced adoption of uh, of vehicles um, electric vehicles that are uh, specifically trucks um, because all the guys in the forest service and all these things are going to be are going to be uh, going to be EV pickup trucks so EV F one fifties and I'm curious to see because a lot of them seem like they sit around for long periods of time too I'm curious. If you're going to start having more of these mobile or light solutions where you have a bunch of solar or something and and or some component of solar and being able to plug in uh to some infrastructure have a, a mobile you know stand set up and then you can either plug the forest service truck in or it has some thing that pops out of the bed and, and helps charge because i think you still probably need it have it up for like three weeks to get an actual charge from it but um there's probably going to be a lot of innovation in that space too that it's going to make yeah. it a little bit more more interesting um, I, th I think it's i think that's a good point it's it's there's a lot more areas that own trucks that we don't know and they're probably gonna be the ones to adopt first like you're saying yeah but the, the, the uh, but and, and sorry, I kind of got away from it. But the the um, but the used uh, used car, car vehicle park prices. I mean, um, do you, do you think do you think we see do you, do you think we see um, that top tested and taken out if if uh, the economy continues to kind of contract versus expand and you, you, and money starts becoming tighter and tighter and tighter or um, I don't see what, in what universe you have. Um, us going back and testing this this uh, April line of uh, um, for the the vehicle uh, value index, you know, I, I I don't see it coming anytime soon. You had you had the issue of I think you and I talked about it on the first episode of people buying cars like on speculation, right? They're willing to pay the markup because they really want the car badly, and they think that they're going to be able to get out of the car, and they don't. I think that's what has caused that spike that last spike before the drop off is people going buying the porsches what is it the gt gt3s when they first came out paying on the markup because of the shortage thinking great i'm, I'm going to be able to drive this and be okay with it and all of a sudden they see the bottom falling out and they're getting out of it you know people people with their, their g wagon doing the same thing people purchasing other cars you know with it they're like oh well, sure. i can turn it I'm curious if Porsche, how Porsche holds up through all this, because I, I I would argue that like what we've what I've seen in the last couple of years, uh, their their value uh, appreciation and stability um, has been pretty robust, and it's there's a huge market for it. There's still people going jumping over one another, even the last month or two. You've seen you know GT3s and some of these like nice Porsches go for a ton of money. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious how that holds up through a, through a contraction. Like if, if, if we're going to see that in the next say 12 months, uh, what does that look like in that market? Um, Cause you would think that 
some of it would die down, but there's such, there seems to be such a density of interested participants that if, if any market holds up reasonably well, uh, meaning, you know, say the ribbon falls 80%, the car value, uh, and, and Porsche, maybe they'd fall 20%. And, you know, but it'll probably be somewhat analogous of what we saw, like in a housing crisis in 08, where if, if you saw like rural, rural areas getting built up because of the expansion of real estate and the expensive prices and people couldn't afford, so they moved, moved out, 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 out. And you saw even places like Elsinore and, and in the middle of nowhere going for a ton of money what happened when the, the real estate bubble buffered? first, those prices just got decimated. The prices in like middle Orange County that has Irvine and, and Mission Viejo, Laguna Hills, all these areas held up reasonably well. Like they, they, they had a, a point where they consolidated, uh, but they didn't drop drastically. Like you saw like uh, Elsinore prices die, you know, for uh, considerably. Um, so I, I have a feeling you probably see a similar thing in the market. In a, in a car market where you see like Porsches probably hold up reasonably well. Um, but then you see a lot of like, like McLarens, I swear to God, if you can't buy one for under a hundred grand, by the time, by the time yeah. things, things, are, things are worth themselves out. I know, right? Like everybody yeah. had one, everybody, had, like, like you saw so yeah. many of them, it was insane. So, you know, I, I think you're right. Porsche has a, a well built in following on their product line, but they're also a very strategic company. They understand the market. They understand how to produce and push cars out there and either to pull back on production, ramp up production. They're constantly having their hand on the throttle. So by doing that, they're giving themselves an advantage that I think a lot of other manufacturers don't, right? It's kind of the German mindset where they're, they're building enough to keep people interested keeping it short enough to where the value is going to retain. And they, I, I think they really started turning that around when the, the 993s turbos skyrocketed in price and they saw the people buying Porsche again, being very excited about it. Um, you know, you can't really put another company out there that does the same thing like they do. McLaren, I feel kind of whores their cars out. I feel like there's, you know, six, 650, 650 LT, 675, 675 LT. They're just constantly making something new to try and make the next better car. And, you know, there's no scarcity in the product. When, you know, what, 2010, what was the production numbers for Lamborghini and Ferrari? They were low. So I think kind of going with what you're saying, you know, all these other manufacturers are the Lake Elsinores, the far out, out reach rural areas, whereas you know, your Porsches, your Mercedes on the limited production, they're the, the tight knit inside middle already developed, been developed for plenty of years, you know, housing community. Well, I mean, here's a good, exa here's a good example of it, right? Like um, about the McLarens kind of dying off too. Like this, the Santa, which like these cars are probably thinking would go for a minimum of like one, five, two million, right? Uh, bit to a million, that's barely enough. Uh, bit to 1.2, okay like 1.4 and I bet you the reserve on this one was probably like one four, like, like they're just not. And then there's a lot here. Yeah. That are going for 150 K. What the heck is this Mustang doing here? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a Mustang McLaren. Yeah. I think the Senate, like those kind of cars are on a different, different spectrum. And it, you can't really look at those in this, in this same feature. You have sure. to look at stuff that's, at least like five hundred thousand below. Sure. Uh, what, what were these going for? What were these going for retail? Like these six fifty S's and the. I think the six fifty S's were two, two fifty somewhere around there. Five seventy. You're going for one eighty five. So the MSRP, MSRP was two sixty five. So it's close two seventy two sixty five. Um, they were up there, you know. And right now, I think you can buy an MP four for under a hundred grand. It's one one twenty four here. Let's see. Oh, it's pro spider. Yeah. Yeah, it's just interesting. I remember seeing these and being like, "Okay, I feel like everybody has these." Actually, to the point where I was uh, riding my bike up in uh, my motorcycle up in um, 
Bay Area, like, you know, the hills over there. And I remember I used to get out, like, super early and go ride the mountains because there's no one up there. And um, I was up at this coffee shop at the top, and there was a gas station there. And so I'd go fill up and stuff. And uh, there was a McLaren that rolled up. And um, as I was filling up and as he's filling up, another McLaren rolled up. Oh yeah, uh, th this is back in twenty like eighteen, and they didn't know each other. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, if I'm sitting here at a three hundred thousand dollar car at a gas station, and somebody else with another car that is exactly like mine, three hundred k rolls up, I'm not gonna feel great about it. I'm not gonna want to talk to this guy. I'm gonna want to punch him in the face. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, one of the guys I go with him, I was like, "Oh, hey, man, comes over and talk to him." I'll be like, "Don't, don't talk to me." I, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? To be fair, that's the same as an Aventador, though. Yeah, maybe. But to maybe. be fair, that's like I can count way too many Aventadors that I see in a week or even in a day. To me, it's like you don't see Orange County problems, there. man. I know. You don't see that many GT3s or GT3 RSs. I'm telling you, Porsche. No, yeah, I mean, that's that, that is true. I mean, there there is a scarcity and a rarity to them. I I I I see one every now and then. Like I'll see them at the show or something. But yeah, it's not like there's a bunch of them. And I, actually, that that has been impressive considering I've never thought of them as being a unique like um, small production car brand. I just that's not how I was familiar with them. They're, they're really not small production. They're just very good, I think, about mitigating what they're producing, how they're putting it out, what they're taking in, and, and, and planning out their market. I think they've just done a good job with it, which is why you see so many more people being fans of Porsches now versus before. So Yeah, yeah. And I think I, I, think I remember hearing, like, Doug DeMuro or whatever talk about that on, what, like, some episode or something he shot, like, where he's talking about his, his history or bringing up upbringing or something. But I think I think he was talking about how he uh, he was a buyer for them um, at some yeah. point. It must I think it was Porsche, and there was a whole strategy behind you know how you space them out and how uh, how many what dealers have how many and and then how that goes like how many do you order? Um, also, them disappearing in the uh, Atlantic Ocean probably doesn't help. Um, well, but they there was they, they, there was that. They, They've been very good, and I'm sure other dealers do this. I don't know how how well, but like, you know, if, if one set of cars isn't moving well in one location, their network, they'll move them to somewhere else that the cars sell, right? So they're helping their dealership programs out as well. Uh, yeah, and you got you yeah. got to figure th those buyers too are probably on their second or third or fourth. Like the yeah. one Porsche guy I know, and and God bless him because I, I really didn't mean a lot to me when he let me just drive it that day. But um, he's like, hey, do you want to? What do you mean you haven't driven one? You want to drive it here? Let's let's drive by. <laughs> Took me on a ride, and I was like, "Okay, this is what this this is these these are Porsche guys." <laughs> yeah. um, but but you got to figure those people are still on their on their end number of them too. Uh, you know when when some attractive version that comes out uh, uh, is out. So but I'm I'm curious how that holds up if, if we do see a contraction in the market. And I, I suspect we do. Um, there, there's there's right now there's no way that we're not going to see it and because of the majority of the cars in the market that move are the ones that are highly affected about what's going on you're the cars that we normally talk about they're those people are rarely affected by what's going on they've already you know seen that coming anticipated it it's not your guy your it tech who is going to work every day and putting his head you know his nose down and getting his work done those are the cars yeah. you're going to see cause the drop off, and these people buying these monkey pictures, these apes. Yeah, and I'm I'm curious how much correlation there is because there's there's definitely been pain there, and and I suspect it's not over. And uh, I'm curious to see how much of it is is because uh, they've been talking about it. Financial media has been talking about how there there isn't much contagion to like broader market like leverage and stuff like that. It's not been really uh, pulled into crypto, so to speak. But I, I'm I'm curious how much of that does have to do with um, how many people were buying stuff on, on crypto gains and stuff that they, now they're not going to be able to. And then actually might provide an opportunity. I mean, being if, if you have an opportunity now to pick up like a 570 McLaren, I guess like okay, maybe now I won't I won't be too sad, you know, finding another one at the gas station. 
uh, because, you know, maybe I didn't pay 300, 400,000 for it. I paid, you know, 90 on auction for it. And I was like, oh, all right, nobody's going to bid with me and it's no reserve. Too bad. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll home it for a little while. I think it's, it's, it's like you said, though, like at, at the start of it, it's, it's one of those things where you, I know you don't want to get too much into the crypto, but it is a big thing behind it, right? That is, that had a big influence in the purchase of those vehicles. And now that you have these larger financial, financial institutions backing those things and, and investing a lot of time and money into it themselves, you know, you're going to see some sort of turnaround. Is it going to be quick? I don't think so. So you're going to see the car market affected in the sense that, yeah, mid market's going to drop off. High end is going to drop off a small percentage. And it's like you said, you're going to see them. You're not going to see them anymore at cars and coffee, or they're going to be pulling up in a very different car. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they'll let me park my actual exotic in the exotics now and not just kick me off to the trucks. They usually let, like me like let me like in the road next to them, but they they're like they're, I do. You know, do you park know your... They sit there and like curate their parking. Dude, they do. Like the major, uh, okay. the main line, the main line, they for sure do. Um, yeah. And that's that's interesting. And yeah, I mean, power to them. You know, they, they do a great great job. I I I was surprised how well it's grown. Uh, for those that don't know, it's uh, the San Clemente Cars and Coffee. Fantastic. Uh, Saturday mornings, nine a.m. Uh, if you're showing a car, you got to get there by 8, 30, 8, 45. Um, but no, and especially summertime right now, it's probably going to be fantastic. Uh, there's no shortage of supercars in, in Southern California too. As long as there, uh, there's people here, they're going to probably have a huge density of, I, I actually don't know. And I've, I've talked to a couple of my car buddies about this, but, um, I feel like, I feel like there's no consistent weekly show that is better than SoCal Cars and Coffee in San Clemente. Like, there's, there's, there's not. Probably not. The only couple markets I can think of would be like uh, Florida. And I mean, would Texas have something like that? No, maybe, maybe Vegas or something. But, but even then, this probably wouldn't be such a, a density. And a lot of the people that are doing that kind of business in Vegas probably don't live there year round. Um, so, yeah. week to week, I mean, you, you, you see Koenigsegg's there, you see, uh, uh zonda uh bugatti uh, like ridiculous stuff there's one guy that has like 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 three eggs or or more and he brings it he brings them down uh from time to time he's just like oh okay I'm like oh it's three three guys meeting up they each have one it's like no it's one guy who's got at least three of them and and, and he brings them down and is like okay it's, cool it's the same guy by the way who has the three zondas yeah 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 yeah, yeah. And it's yeah, man, cool, cool and people. It's cool yeah, yeah, maybe prob probably good pe people to be friends with too. Because somebody's got to drive that car down. And I know that if it was me, I'd be like, "Hey, Robert, you know, which one are you taking this yeah. week?" Right. So you got to figure that thing, you, you got to figure he he probably be he's probably doing the same thing. He's like, "Hey, you know, who, who wants to take these down?" Uh, which, by the way, whoever whoever that is, I'm I'm happy to, to drive it. I'll even uh, teach my two year old how to drive a stick. They can they can take that down town too. Um, you just have her drive the Hummer. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, actually, it was really cute too. Uh, this this last time I went, um, uh, and she loves her boom boom probably more than I even I even do. Um, and uh, she's kind of gotten the idea where when she's around it, people are going around and like looking at it. So this this last time, uh, she was like walking around the car and like pointing and giving people thumbs up. Man, it was so cute. I, I tried to capture it on a video, but there was another guy that was like talking to me about it. And so I was trying to like make sure she didn't walk out in traffic and talk to the guy without being too rude. So, um, but uh, it's it's fun. I'm, I'm uh, I, I know it's going to be a little while for you to to be able to take uh, yeah. yours down there, but uh, in in time it'll be a fun fun event to go take the family down there. Well, you're gonna have a second one here real soon to influence as well. Yes, 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 yes. I can't wait. I can't wait. As soon as, my, as soon as my sleep patterns get back to normal, yours are gonna be thrown off. Yeah, yeah, I'm terrified. All right, brother. Anything else for uh, for this week? No, no, no. Got some uh, good plans for next week's episode, and I think uh, you'll be excited for it too. All right, stay tuned. Some doozies.